And of course, you, you weren't always completely blind. You were blind in one eye, and then you lost the other eye at, uh, about uh, five years ago or something like that? Yeah, four, four years ago, at the age of 12, um, eventually cancer yeah. took my right eye, which, you know, was... Had to be super hard. It was. It was hard, but you know, you've, yeah. you've seen what God has done with it. It's amazing. Well, Jake, your message is so encouraging. Of course, we interviewed you, I think it was a year and a half ago. I think you were about this much shorter and this much skinnier. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, so, uh, well, we're so glad to have you here. And who's your dog? This is Quebec. Hi, this Quebec. Is Quebec. He's my guide dog. Oh, and so, Aww. yeah, he, uh, he, he might do a couple of things up here during the service. So if you see him wandering or barking or uh, just know that he, uh, he's happy to be here, too. Well, Jake, it's a, yeah. it's a real honor to have you here, and we feel so blessed to hear from you. Ladies and gentlemen, would you give him a big hand and a big welcome, Jake Olson. Thank you, Jake. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, it is an honor to be back here on Hour of Power. It was such a great experience last time, and so it's just an honor to be here and be able to speak to you guys this morning. As I mentioned, I, I went blind around four years ago, and you think about how much you use your eyesight. It's, it's, you use it every day in everything you do. And so to lose that was, was hard. You know, I, I had to adapt a lot. I had to come up with tricks and new ways to do things, to learn how to read again and walk again and all these different things. But to say, one of the toughest things, if not the toughest thing about being blind is actually people forgetting that I am blind. You know, I'm not talking about you know, people I just meet or you know, friends I haven't seen in, little, in a little while that aren't used to me being blind. I'm talking about close family members and close friends. Why? For example, not too long ago I uh, came back from an AP bio trip down in Florida and it, we were down in the Keys of Florida and we, we were doing a lot of snorkeling and we were on these boats and uh, these boats were called flat tops actually. And, if you picture a pontoon boat, it looked a lot like that, where on each side were these openings to the water and um, little, little gates, but there was no gate there, just dropped off into the water. And that's how you would exit and enter onto the boat. And anyways, we went snorkeling and we came back on the boat and you know, I took off my gear and you know, put on a shirt, grabbed the towel. And, you know, and you know, six of my friends are on the boat, two teachers, you know, a captain, and you know, I'm, I'm looking for one of them to kind of help me try to find a seat and no, you know, no one's really paying attention to me or anything like that. So I'm trying to find a seat by myself and you know, here comes the other side and all of a sudden psh, I fall on the other side of the water, back into the water. And then everyone goes, oh my gosh, Jake, you're right. It's like, oh, now you're gonna pay attention to me. You know? <laughs> Where were you <laughs> 30 seconds ago when I'm trying to find a seat? You know? It's like, oh, we forgot. Or my own mother even. You know, I, it was last weekend actually, I was in the supermarket with her and, I was walking up and down the aisles talking to her and we were uh, in discussion and we stopped and I asked her a question and there's no response. And so, you know, I, I figured, you know, she's reading a label or something like that, she's preoccupied. So I asked the question again and no response. So I kind of feel off her like, mommy, mommy, you there? And she's not there anymore. I'm like, well, where'd she go? <laughs> not until about 45 seconds later down the hall, like all the way down the other side of the aisle, Oh, sorry, Jake, I left you standing there. I forgot, I moved down here now. I mean, I was standing in the middle of the aisle. People were trying to get around me. The people were crashing into each other, and you know, store managers were coming up after I need help. It was a big mess. It's just... It's... <laughs> Anyways, I guess at the end of the day, I have to take it as a compliment. Well, I did battle cancer for 12 years of my life, and these weren't easy battles. During my life, the cancer came back around eight times and, let's see, there you go. And each time I, Quebec, what are you barking up? up? And each time I did battle. At the age of one, I lost my left eye to cancer and I missed many days and weeks of school due to chemotherapy. I went through countless surgeries. But I stand here in front of you today thankful for the blessings that God has given me in my life. You see, in the book of 1 Thessalonians, it says that we are supposed to be thankful in all circumstances for the will of God. Now, why don't you say that, all circumstances? It doesn't say some circumstances. It doesn't say circumstances we think we should be thankful for. No, there are no qualifiers. It's simple. We are supposed to approach life with a grateful heart 
And this can only be done with the grace of God. Now, I can understand you're sitting there right now going, you know, well, Jake, you just told us how you faced cancer your entire life. You went blind and you went through all these struggles. I, I can't sit here th and think that you were just you know, jolly all the time and, you know, you were thankful all the time and you, you didn't go struggle and you weren't sad or mad. And I'm not going to lie to you. There were plenty of times I was sad. There were plenty of times I was mad or angry. Even till today I get sad. You know, not a day goes by that I wake up and don't realize I'm blind and wish I wasn't. But one thing I held on to throughout all the adversity in my life is my faith. God said that he had a plan for my life and I believe that. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Standing in your faith. Standing in your faith when things are good. Standing in your faith when things are bad. Standing in your faith when the unthinkable is upon you. There is nothing more powerful in all of creation than when you stand in your faith and God's grace and remain in his will when you are facing the most difficult times in your life. See, at an early age, I learned that life was gonna bring challenges and adversity. And challenges I've had. But what I've also learned is, God's not gonna give you anything that you can't handle. You see, every struggle I faced has only strengthened my faith. It's true, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. During with my battle with cancer, I put my faith into Jesus Christ. My favorite verse is Jeremiah 29 and 11. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, but to give you hope in a future. See, so I've learned that God does have a plan for all our lives. That's beyond our imagination. If we listen to his whisper, we can find out who we really are and what our true potential is. It is my faith and God's grace that got me through the daily struggles of cancer, the treatment, the thought of going blind, and ultimately, the reality of going blind. It was his grace that got me through my darkest hours. My faith does not come and go either. It is always with me. It means every day, Every day, even when times are scary, even when times are rough, even when times aren't making sense, I continue to put my faith into God and that, that he has a plan for my life. You know, there's different definitions for faith. It can be elusive. But what faith means to me is where the works and promises of God are made real. Now, only you know where you are in your faith, in your walk with God. But I urge you this. Never grow weak in your faith. Never grow weary in your faith. Always be prepared. You don't know when it's going to be tested. Pastor Schuler mentioned that all this stuff. I do golf and, and play football, and I'm a pretty athletic guy, and I grew up in Huntington Beach, so I, I love to surf, uh, you know, surf city. And so when I'm out on the ocean... It's similar to being prepared in your faith. You see, when I'm out on the ocean, I always have to be conscious about where my board is. I always have to know where my board is and be prepared to hang on to my board. It's like in life. We have to know where our faith is. We have to be prepared to grab onto our faith. See, when I'm on the ocean, I can't see those waves coming. I don't know when they're gonna come and hit. But if I'm prepared to hang on to my board, and those ways do come, it, this is not going to knock me off my board. I'll be able to grab on, stay afloat, and still be paddling out to the ocean. In life, we can't always see adversity coming. It can just come up and hit us. But if you know where your faith is, and you're prepared to grab on to your faith, and you're standing on that firm rock that God provides, that adversity is not going to knock you off. You're going to be standing there, ready to move on through life. You see, as Christians, we are required to be strong 
prepared in our faith. We should learn to surf by faith, not by sight. Since going blind, I've realized what's important in life. The moment I went blind, God gave me a greater gift than my physical sight. He opened my eyes to my true potential. So not only do I love to surf, but I love to play golf. I'm on my high school varsity golf team. I also love to play football. I'm on my high school varsity football team. I love to snow ski. I'm in my honors choir. I love to sing and play guitar. I love to hang out and play video games, play poker. You guys should see my poker face. It beats that all my friends, yeah. No, but when I found out I was gonna go blind, I made a decision that blindness was not gonna rob me of my childhood. It wasn't gonna rob me of my future. I also spent time out in the blind community, inspiring other blind kids, helping them see their true potential. I'm my own foundation called Out of Sight Faith that helps blind kids get the technology they need to succeed in school. I just wrote a new book called Open Your Eyes. I'll be talking about that a little later in the message. and It'll be for sale after the service if you would like to buy a copy. See, I live a life full of light and hope. And anything I want, anything I want to take on, I want the power of heaven behind me. But I also don't want to leave you here with the impression that I have everything figured out. You know, I constantly pray for God's grace and I constantly pray for his guidance. And just because I'm not being stopped doesn't mean I'm sometimes frustrated or squarely reminded that I am blind. I mean, let's take golf for instance. I think we can all agree that golf is not an easy thing to do. And I'm gonna let you guys in on a little secret today, all right? It doesn't get any easier when you can't see the ball. <laughs> Anywhere I go in golf, on the weekends, I'm the only blind guy out there. You know, I go to golf in my high school matches, I'm the only blind guy out there. And golfing blind has required me to dig deep. And I dig deeper every day. The patience, the perseverance and the mental toughness that golf has taught me has shown up in different aspects of my life. So I believe my potential in golf is unlimited. I believe my potential in life is unlimited. As I mentioned, I just came out with a new book called Open Your Eyes. The book challenges the reader to open their eyes to their true potential. Have you asked God that recently? You say, God, will you open my eyes to my true potential? God, will you open my eyes to your will in my life? I promise you, you ask him that, he will answer. Because we serve a God full of hope, and he gives hope beyond measure. You know, another message that's found in my book is finding the setup in the setback. See, I don't know where you are in your struggles right now, but I can promise you this. Your darkest hour can soon become your brightest. Every day is a miracle waiting to happen. And your job is to find that miracle. In other words, you're trying to find the set up in the setback. See, living with cancer was a setback in my life. For 12 years, we were constantly in our doctor's offices, constantly in hospitals receiving treatment. Eventually, I went blind, and that was a setback in my life. One that I never thought was possible. But going blind has opened my life up to a new life full of amazing opportunities. Now, I often wonder, what would my life be like if I never went blind or I never faced cancer? Well, I know I wouldn't be here speaking to you today. I know I've never set up a foundation that helps other blind kids. I know I've written, never written a book that inspires thousands. So you gotta see the setup and the setback. You know, I go and speak to lots of people and I'll 
Some of these people are, include groups of blind people, and many of them cannot see the setup and the setback. They're depressed and discouraged. They've let blindness stop them in their tracks. And that's not what God wants. It's the work of the enemy. You know, a good example comes out of the book of Mark. We get a story of blind Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus was a beggar around the time of Jesus uh, in Jericho. It was believed at the time that beggars would wear a, a cloak with a special insignia on it that basically gave them permission to beg. So one day while Bartimaeus is on the roadside doing his thing and begging and he hears that Jesus is walking by and so he cries out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Now to make a public declaration calling Jesus the son of David is to call him the prophesied Messiah. To call him that publicly is dangerous to say the least. Many people are killed or prosecuted for saying things such as that. So the people around and told him, you know, be quiet, don't, don't say anything. So what does Barmaeus do? He says it louder. Jesus, our son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus sees this demonstration of undaunted faith, he calls Barnabas to him. It says that Barnabas got up, threw down his cloak, and went to Jesus. And Jesus healed him because of his faith. So what's so uncommon about Barnabas' faith? You see, when he hears that Jesus is walking by, he immediately calls out to Jesus and addresses him, as a prophesied Messiah, exhibiting an insight into Jesus' true mission here on earth. He also has an unstoppable faith, a faith that would not take no for an answer. You see, when Bartimaeus calls out, and he's told to be quiet, he doesn't listen. He cries out all the louder, and the people are embarrassed that the town beggar goes ballistic as Jesus walks by. But Bartimaeus doesn't care. He has an intensity of desire that overcomes obstacles, rebuke, and embarrassment to achieve what he desires. And Jesus is pleased. So when Bartimaeus got up and threw down his cloak, he took a leap of faith. He made a decision that he was going to trust God. He was going to trust that God knew where he was going to lead his life. He made a decision that he was no longer going to live the life that he chose for himself to live. That he was no longer going to live the life that society chose for him to live but he was now gonna live the life that God chose for him to live. See, my life is similar. I too had to take a leap of faith. I too had to trust that God knew where he was leading my life. Trust me, I didn't wanna go blind. I didn't. But my opinion didn't matter. God had a plan for me, and it was my job to trust in that plan. It's my job now to focus on the life that God has in store for me and not the life that I thought would suit me best. See, I believe Bartimaeus' cloak not only stood for a reason to beg, but stood for the life that he chose to live. See, we all have cloaks in our lives. These cloaks stand for the reasons why we are not complete in our relationship with God. These cloaks are the reasons why we are not letting God lead our lives in the way that he wants to. As I mentioned before, Jeremiah says that God has a plan for us, full of hope and prosperity. The Bible says that God loves us he loves us so much that he sent his one and only son to die for us. And he says that he'll always take care of you, no matter what. 
then why? Why are we not letting God lead our lives in the way that he wants to? Are you scared? Is your own pride getting in the way? Maybe you're sitting there thinking to yourself, you know, I don't need God. I'm a successful man in life. I know how to play this game. I don't need some divine authority telling me how to live my life. I can do it myself. Maybe you're sitting there thinking to yourself, you know, Jake, I, I believe in God, yeah. I, I really do, and I believe and he died for me, and he'll take care of me, but I'm going through a hard time as, as it is, and I, I don't know if I can just completely trust him and put my life into his hands. You know, I, I, I'd feel a little more secure if I took my life over a little bit. You know, you, you really expect me to put complete faith in him? And the answer is Yes. The only way we can live up to our true potential in accordance to God's will is by demonstrating complete faith. It's the only way. Let me put it in a different word for you. Your goal in life should not be to become wealthy. Your goal in life should not be to become famous. Your goal in life should not be to own the nicest things, to have the most friends, to be able to show off. Your goal in life should be none of that. Your goal in life should be to live the life that God has in store for you. It should be your goal. See, God does have a plan for you. beyond your imagination. He knew what he wanted you to do even before you were born. So I ask you, what is your cloak? What is your cloak? What do you need to remove in your life in order to complete your relationship with Christ. What is it? Once you know what it is, it's simple. All you gotta do is take off that cloak. Open your eyes and let God lead your life in the way that he wants to. Bartimaeus, didn't care about obstacles, rebuke, or embarrassment. He had an intensity of desire to take that leap of faith. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. I want to conclude by saying this. I stand in front of you today and say that I'm complete in my relationship with Christ. I've taken off my cloak. Blindness, the labels, they mean nothing to me. Brokenness, where it exists, is in the mind, not the body. My mind, body, and soul remain whole. And I thank God for that every day. Helen Keller once said, I see a God-made world not a man-made world. I see that same world, and I walk by faith, not by sight. Thank you. Thank you, Jake, for your message. You've really touched the hearts of these people here. You can tell it meant a lot to them what you said. And we're so grateful that you came here and blessed us this morning. Thank you, thank you. And I'm no longer the youngest person to preach here, which is really (laughs) great. That's good news. We we really are touched and inspired. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity.